then I'll introduce the talk, and then I'll actually do the talk, and afterwards I'll tell you what I said. So if you should drop off at some point, it's okay. I mean, I'll, I'll do a recap in the end. So my name is uh, Aino Kori, and I used to be a developer, but I'm not anymore. Now I'm what I call a meta-developer, because I'm facilitating meetings for developers. I'm teaching developers. I've been teaching at university and in industry. And I'm putting together conferences much like this, but at other parts of the world. So I'm not a developer, but I'm developing developers, and thus I'm a meta-developer. I come from a country called Denmark. How many of you have been to Denmark? Oh, some of you have been to Denmark. So you know that it's, uh, it's quite far away from here, and you can see, so the Google Maps is showing that my, my son is, uh, is at home in Denmark right now, and we are all the way over here. And I arrived at 3 o'clock last night, so luckily the jet lag hasn't started yet. I have simply no idea where I am or what time it is, so uh, if I fall asleep, please somebody wake me up. And I want to tell you what it looks like in Denmark. So this is, I think, from a tourist brochure. We've got beaches all over because we're a small country in the middle of the ocean. Not many people, six million people, and it's just beaches everywhere. But if you actually live in Denmark, you know that's not exactly what it looks like. So if you live in Denmark, it's mostly like this, cycling in the snow. How many of you tried that, cycling in the snow? Yeah, Dave has as well. It's not the most pleasant thing in the world, but it gets you from A to B. So that was a little bit about myself, and I'm doing this talk about anti-patterns for retrospectives because I've been facilitating retrospectives for something like 10 years. And what I noticed was that I kept making the same mistakes over and over again. And it's a bit ironic that I didn't really learn from these mistakes since I was facilitating retrospectives, right? But let's not delve into that. But I've started learning now from my mistakes, and I've seen that there are some patterns and things that come over and over in my retrospectives. But other also in other people's retrospectives. So the, the point of this talk is to create better retrospectives by awareness of anti-patterns. And I'll come into later what an anti-pattern is. So what I want you to have is better retrospective, a more fun retrospective, or at least less painful retrospectives. That's my goal with this talk. And I have, uh, I've chosen six anti-patterns for retrospectives. And if any of you were at my talk about distributed retrospectives two years ago in Agile India, there's two of them you've seen before, and I wondered whether I should take them out and replace them with others, but on the other hand, they're very important, and it's two years ago, so you probably most likely forgot it anyway. So, I, they, they're here. And uh, I want to tell you, as I said, what an anti-pattern is. So I've, I've brought with you an example of an anti-pattern, the first anti-pattern I heard of. And um, it's something to do with the programming in object orientation. So I hope that some of you at least know something about programming in an object-oriented language. Otherwise, you can just shut down for a while, and, uh, and I'll tell you when to come back. So an example of an anti-pattern. First, you have like the context or the problem. Where are you right now? Where were you when this problem arised? So you need to figure out where to place the functionality of the class. That's always the thing that you're thinking about when you're doing an object oriented design, where do I put this functionality? Which class does it belong to? And then the forces are the things like in the reality that, that draws you in this direction or this direction. So there are different reasons for choosing one or the other. So you're using object orientation, but another force is you might be experienced in imperative or functional programming. So perhaps the ways that you solve problems come from a different field. And the anti-pattern solution, which is the bad solution that you normally just jump to, is that you play all of your methods, pay, put all of your methods in your favorite class, and that becomes the heart of the architecture. And the problem with that, the problem with that anti-pattern solution, or the consequences, is that your class will become extremely big, which is not a problem in itself, apart from the fact that it's difficult to read, but also that it'll be difficult to understand and maintain afterwards. So that's a problem that you get. That's the anti-pattern solution. And just to illustrate, this pattern, anti-pattern, is called the blob. I don't know if any of you saw the uh, sci-fi um, scary movie like 30 or 40 years ago called The Blob, but it was about a big jelly thing coming down from outer space, and it would suck everything into it. So if it touched something, that would become part of the blob. If it touched a tree, that would become part of the blob. If it touched Dave Farley, he would become part of the blob. And that is sort of to illustrate what that class in your system would be. It would be a blob. It would suck up everything. 
So what do you do then if you have the blob? Do you just quit your job, run somewhere else, change the log file so it doesn't pass your name on it or something like that? No, there's actually things you can do about it. There's what we call a refactored solution. And that I think is the beauty of answer patterns. It's not just, you did this wrong, but there's also a refactored solution. I have to admit that sometimes the refactored solution is actually to change jobs, but that is not any of the solutions I'm doing today. So refactor the class by merging the methods into other classes. And the strategies for that is uh, that you use high cohesion and low coupling. There's some books for that. But now it's known as microservices. So a lot of people will do that now. They will take a big blob of uh, legacy code and they'll create microservices out of it. So actually, the, the blob is, uh, is the anti-pattern for microservices. The benefits and drawbacks is that you'll have smaller classes, which are easier to maintain and easier to get an overview of. It'll take some time to refactor it, but the trade-off is it'll be worth the time. So to illustrate this, I just pulled out this old picture from the anti-patterns book that tells you that instead of having like this huge class, you just take things out and put them in different smaller classes or microservices, if you wish. So that was my attempt to explain what an anti-pattern is, because some people just think that's very negative to have an anti-pattern. But the refactored solution is an important part of it. Now, I want to tell you a story about a Danish company uh, called Titanic AS. It uh, creates reliable navigation software for ships. And uh, we have a small team in this, in this company. We've got Peter, Nikki, Susan, Jim, Sarah, and Robert. And uh, Titanic, Titanic has had some problems with its clients. So some of them are complaining about the navigational software in the ships. There's been some accidents. Uh, and then they, of course, want to do agile. They want to make things better. So they, they sent everybody off on a Scrum Master course. And then they need to figure out who should be the Scrum Master. And, and Sarah, Sarah is the one uh, who, who is mostly interested in this. So she is becoming the Scrum Master. So we now have a small team with a Scrum Master called Sarah. And uh, what happens then? Sarah is about to facilitate her first retrospective because she's a scrum master. And she has, she's read the book about uh, project retrospectives by Norm Kurth. And in that book, we've got something called the, the prime directive of retrospectives. So that regardless of what we discover, we must understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job he or she could, given what was known at the time, his or her skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. That's what Norm Kurth said that you, th you should think about whenever you start a retrospective. Unfortunately for Sarah, she's doing retrospectives for developers. And some of these developers does not have that mindset when they go into the retrospective. Some of them are thinking, hmm, actually he is an idiot, or uh, she just ruined that, or they have been very lazy, and they definitely did not do the best they could. So we need a scapegoat to point fingers at. And she knows this, so she doesn't want to talk about the Prime Directive because she's worried if she says something about the Prime Directive that these developers will think that this is just a lot of BS, it's just feely, feely, touchy stuff, and that's really ridiculous. So she doesn't mention the Prime Directive. And that leads us to the anti-pattern called Prime Directive Ignorance. And what happens with Prime Directive Ignorance is that if you don't even believe that the Prime Directive is a good idea, then you will definitely fail. So. Um, yeah, I tried to make a joke. Thank you for somebody um, laughing at it. It was very, very polite of you. So the, the point of this uh, prime directive ignorant anti-pattern is that the, the problem is that it feels awkward to follow the directive. It feels awkward sometimes even for the facilitator to say that people should follow the directive because he or she knows that people will not think that everybody did their best. And then what happens in, in this anti-pattern is that you just forget about it. You don't mention it. You don't say anything about it. You just start the retrospective like you always do. But the consequences are that people will bring all their assumptions and negative expectations to the retrospective. They will not have the right mindset. Necessarily, some of them do, of course, but not everybody does. And there's no focus on having the right mindset. Because they're so eager to find failures. They're so eager to find mistakes. They're so eager to find scapegoats. And the anecdotal evidence is that people do not really listen and in the end, people will become afraid to go to the retrospectives or to say anything that's important at the retrospectives. And then the refactored solution, of course, obviously, is to bring the directive to each retrospective in some way. And I'm not necessarily saying that you should put this on the wall, 
But for instance, in the email, you could remind people about it when you invite them, or you could say it at the beginning of the retrospective. Remember that we're not trying to fight scapegoats. Remember that we have this mindset that we expect that everybody did the best they could. Because if you look at what people actually did and the mistakes that happened, it's, not, it's often not because the people are evil. It's because they had problems. There was something they didn't know. There was somebody that didn't have the skill set that they needed. And, and what I see often is if, if the prime directive is part of not just the retrospective, but the whole organization, the organization is a very nice place to be. I, I definitely can remember differences between having a manager who did not believe in this prime directive and a manager who did believe in this prime directive. I remember making huge mistakes and one manager would tell me off, but another manager would say, that's very interesting, thank you for telling me, let's look at the system. And the first time that happened to me, I was surprised. I thought I'd get told off, but he just said, that's very interesting. Let's figure out what information you had at the, at the time. Let's figure out what skills you had, how we can do things differently. So creating a learning experience out of failure. And now I want you to try something. Think about this for 20 seconds, the prime directive and whether it is a problem where you are in your retrospective. Just think about it on your own for 20 seconds. And now talk to your neighbor, unless you're shy and would rather just play with your phone. So if you sit with your phone, your neighbor won't talk to you. But please just spend a minute talking to your neighbor or neighbors about this, whether it's a problem for you in your organization. Right, some, some of you know this game, that when you see me raise my hand, then you're quiet and you raise your hand. Thank you very much for, uh, for working along in this. This is different from Denmark, right? I mean, people don't like to talk to each other in Denmark. This is beautiful. I like this. <laughs> but perhaps I didn't prepare well enough. I'll bring some bells next time. <laughs> so um, is there anybody who'd like to share just one or two? Is it a problem? Yes, please. Uh, the team reports to me at the uh, individual moment. So, in my one-on-one -on -one discussions with the team, I have always made them comfortable with failure. Mm -hmm. I have always told them, if you fail, I want to be the first person to understand why, and we can always talk about that. So, mm -hmm. I think we have come from a way where the retrospective failed to a place where people fail and they are not afraid. Yeah, sounds very good. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Anybody else who wants to? Yeah. yeah? part is the team really empathizes with each other, so it's a good team. But in the way of empathizing with each other, they tone down the retrospective to such a way that they would sugarcoat so many things uh, that need to be brought yeah. out together. So I think that's a tricky ground that we're facing right now, you know, they want to say it, but mm -hmm. they're, they're just sugarcoating it too much that it's going to be really effective for everybody. Yeah. That's a good point. They want to be very nice to each other to yeah. the extent that they're sugarcoating it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not a problem in Denmark. We're very rude. <laughs> um, but I can I can sense that it's a problem here. You're all very polite. Um, but so, yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah. So my example. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So my experience, I can share with 
Yeah. It's better now. Good. Yeah, that sort of feeds back, feeds forward to one of the answer patterns that will come later in this talk. Did you want to say something as well there in the back? Yeah, and that's good. <laughs> Sorry. To, uh, to avoid the failures. Yeah, well, I think the only way to avoid failures is, is to learn from what's happening and then change things the next time. Depends a lot on the failure, of course. I think one problem that I see is often that the communication is, is not that easy. It could be because of the sugar coating. They don't want to point out things that are problems, but it could also be that they, they perhaps they've seen some retrospectives that doesn't work, and then they say, well, who cares? Why, why, do we, why do we want to talk about things that's important to us if it's just the same over and over again? And I'll be coming back to those issues during the talk. Yeah? Uh, since we spoke about communication, usually when the team is collocated, it's, uh, you can try different ways. You can, uh, the team mingles with each other. They see each other on a day-to-day -day basis. But when the team is uh, distributed, like, yeah. uh -huh, distributed teams, uh, it's quite difficult to have the retrospective because you usually have it over a phone call and uh, it becomes very formal uh, what went right, what went wrong, what didn't go well. So probably if there is a question that you could cover the distributed team. Well, that's a whole different talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually you could find my talk about distributed retrospective from two years ago online and I have a blog post about it. We might have time later, but I'll be here for three days, so, yeah. I find that very interesting, and I agree, it is, it is problematic, yeah. Right, um, so what you just did was an example of something called Think, Pair, Share, that I use a lot in my teaching, but I also use it at retrospectives. You probably notice sometimes if people ask a question to a lot of people, it'll only be the extroverts and the active thinkers who will be answering, because they... What, well, some of them think very fast, some of them just don't bother to think before they answer. You probably know the, the situation. And then we have the people who are more reflective or introvert, and, and you never hear their voices. So think, pair, share is just a pattern that I use in retrospectives or talks or, or teaching, where people have a time to think on their own, to reflect and talk to somebody in a way that it's, it's fairly safe because it's only two, and then people can choose to share if they want to. So that was just an extra thing. <coughs> So after four weeks, Sarah is doing the next retrospective, and she took the Scrum Master course, as I said. And uh, I think according to your comment down there, she learned a way to do it. And the, learn, the way to do it was, what should we start doing, what should we start doing, what should we do more of, less of, etc. And to me, that is actually, or it can be, an anti-pattern that I call the, the Wheel of Fortune. And the reason why I call it the Wheel of Fortune is that if, if you're just saying, what should we start doing, what should we stop doing, what should we do more of or less of, sometimes what you're looking at is actually just symptoms of the actual problems. So for instance, it could be, we, sh we should do more pair programming, something like that. And, and then that's, uh, well, that's a post-it note that's put up in the start and everybody dot loads and that is the one that we'll have, so that'll be our action point, that'll be more pair programming. But if you didn't take the time to actually think about is this actually a problem that we don't have enough, or is it a symptom of another problem? It could be just that they don't have time to do pair programming, and then it's a problem, and then that solution is great. But it could also be that people are very introvert, that they haven't found a way to do pair programming in a way that helped them or made them feel safe, and then just ordering them to do more pair programming will not solve the problem. 
because the problem is different and this is just a symptom. And you could probably think about other things that are actually just symptoms of problems. And that's why I call it the wheel of fortune, because it's like just rolling this wheel of fortune. And sometimes you're correct, this thing that you need to start, start doing is actually the thing that you want to change. But sometimes there's a story behind, and you need to go into that story. So let's look at the anti-pattern for the wheel of fortune. Well, the problem, as I said, is we're all very busy, and retrospectives take time from coding. So let's do the 45-minute retrospective that you can learn about in, in some old Scrum Master book or some other books. Let's, let's just do it as fast as we can. If every job just put up these post-it notes, we know exactly what to do more of or less of. But the problem is that if you skip a two in the retrospective, and I'll get back to what I meant with the, a step or two in the retrospective, if you skip that and you just get on with it, you will actually have some really bad problems consequences. Because as I tried to say before, the problems that you find and suggest solutions for are only the symptoms of the real problems. Not necessarily always, but sometimes they are. And then you're solving things, and then at the next retrospective, the same problem will come up again. You'll have like a Groundhog Day retrospective. It will show its face in different ways, because it is just symptoms of, of an underlying cause. So what do you do? Well, what you do is that you remember the step called generating insights before you figure out what to do. So, because if you look at, at um, like the, uh, the life of a retrospective, it's got five different phases, and all five phases are very important. But sometimes, in order to skip things and just go back to the real work, the coding, you'll just drop some things that are really important, like setting the stage, getting ready. I always ask all the people in my retrospective to say something. It could be something stupid. It could be what was your breakfast, or how was your Christmas vacation, or how, if you should describe this last sprint as a weather forecast, how it would be. And these, these questions seem stupid, but what they do is actually two different things. One is that all, everybody is forced to say something, and that means it's easier for them psychologically to say something later. For the people who find it hard to say something, if they're allowed to be silent from the beginning, it's much easier for them to stay silent. So just Demand everybody to say something. And when it comes to distributed retrospectives, for instance, if people are not co-located, if they're not working together, the thing about becoming a team or becoming good colleagues is even more difficult, not just for the retrospectives. And I truly believe that in order to work well together, you need trust. And one of the things that gives you trust is to know something about each other. So for these people who are distributed, I ask them silly questions like, what's the weather like where you are? How was your breakfast? Or how do you celebrate uh, Christmas? Or what do you do in the weekend? Things about private things. And in the beginning, they'll be like, oh, I'm a developer. I don't really like to hear about my colleagues' private life. But they will laugh with each other, and they'll learn about each other, and it will build the trust that they need. So I think that this, even though it's a very small part of the retrospective, is really important. Then you gather data. You look at what has happened. That is part of the retro in the retrospective. It could be a timeline like this one. It could be what to do more of, less of, what to start doing, stop doing, not necessarily saying that that is a bad activity. It's only bad if you skip the next step. Because the next step is to generate insights, to figure out why did this happen? How is this affecting you? It could be like this line saying, how do you feel right now? Did it give you energy? Did it take away your energy? Make people tell the stories behind, and even if if there's something that's very important and you don't really know what it is, you could use things like the fishbone or the five wires to actually really do some course analysis. But it's very important and it's very, very difficult. And it's what people sometimes skip. Because also as developers, we are very good at solving things. So whenever we see a problem, we just dive right into the solution. And as a facilitator, you need to open that field of communication and you shouldn't allow them to, to, to close it and to come up with solutions until they've spent some time in that terrible, terrible place where they actually don't know for sure what they're talking about. But that's very difficult as a facilitator, but very important. And then you decide what to do, and then numerous ways of doing that. It could be brainstorming. But what is important is that you have some sort of smart goal, something that is specific, instead of just saying more pro pair programming. It should be how much pair programming, by whom, when does it start, and when do we evaluate whether this experiment actually worked? Because instead of talking about changes, as we also heard in the morning keynote, um, experiments are much easier for people to, to accept. And then you close the retrospective, and that's also important. It's important to say, we started here, we gathered this data, 
we had these discussions, we decided what to do, and this is what we'll do. And next time we have a retrospective, we will look at the result of these experiments and we'll see whether they worked or not, whether this is something we'll implement. And this is important for two reasons. One reason is that oftentimes a retrospective, they come up with action points and nobody looks at them. So it's important to figure out who is responsible, not for doing this, but for making sure that this experiment actually takes place and to come up with the result. And another thing is that sometimes I've experienced as a facilitator that sometimes the people in my retrospective think that I made all the decisions. Oh, I, I didn't do anything here. It was just the facilitator who told us what to do. So to me, it's very important to go through all the different steps and say you came from here and you went here and you did that on your own. Right. More time goes. Now Sarah enters the anti-pattern, death by postponement. I think that's a very good name for an anti-pattern. Death by postponement. Um, the problem is that you, you notice a problem, right? Oh, there's a problem here with the test, or there's a problem with the communication with the analysts or something like that. And uh, your solution might be to just say, well, we've got a retrospective coming up in a week. I can, we can talk about this at the retrospective because we've been told, we've been trained that these are the places where you talk about problems. So I just put it on a post-it note and I remember to talk about it in a week. And of course the consequences is that the solution is delayed. Something that perhaps could have been solved today is delayed to the next retrospective. But an added problem is that when you already, at a retrospective sometimes there are so many things to talk about that if you, if you talk about things that people already know, it seems like a waste of time. One of the things that I find really magical and interesting about retrospectives is when people share something and they get surprised. And they look at the timeline and they say, I didn't know this happened. When did this start working? Or why did this taste fail? Or are you going on maternity leave tomorrow? I mean, I've seen all sorts of things coming up at retrospectives and there should be... Sorry. I borrowed this computer, I don't know why it's talking to us. <laughs> um, and the refactored solution is to raise the problem when it occurs, of course, and use the retrospective as time to explore. And what are the strategies of raising the problem when it occurs? It's something that I learned from Linda Rising called real-time retrospective, so real-time timeline. And this is a picture from, from a team that I'm doing retrospectives for, and what they have is a real-time timeline. So in the office where they're sitting, they have this timeline and they can put up post-it notes if something is good or something is bad or they have questions about something. Because, I mean, in the ideal world, we wouldn't need any retrospectives. People would just talk about things when they arise with the right people and we would solve it. But it is not the ideal world yet. And it is difficult sometimes to talk about failures. It's difficult sometimes even to share that there was something you were happy about. And these post-it notes makes it easier for most people because they can sort of put it on a piece of paper and it's not your feelings anymore. People can look at it and move it around. So a real-time timeline can make it easier for people to share how things are going on. So I wanted to ask you this, but I think we'll skip it because then we'll have more time in the end. And then we'll move to the next retrospective. So time is, time is going and, and Sarah is hearing things like we do not get enough out of the retrospective the time for coding is more important they always blame me for this we can do it in half the time people are getting tired of the retrospectives they think they're not efficient they think they're boring so now we're in the anti-pattern called let's get it over with and uh, I sometimes see at companies where they start with a one and a half hour retrospective, then it goes back to an hour, and then it's 45 minutes, and then you're asked, can you do it in 30 minutes? And then some people show up 10 minutes late, and you have 20 minutes for the retrospective. And of course, if you've got like 20 minutes for a retrospective with five phases that are equally important, it's, you, you might as well not do it. Then it definitely is a waste of time. And then you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot as a facilitator if you're allowing that to happen. But it's not easy. Let's look at the anti-pattern. So the problem is that the time for coding is more important. That's often a problem. People say, let's do some real work instead of all this talking and post-it notes. The anti-pattern solution is that the retrospective vanish. They, like, they, they die little by little, and in the end, they're completely gone. The consequences is that the time is saved, but more time is wasted on not learning, not having continuous improvement. 
And the refactored solution is to restart them, get new activities, get an outside facilitator, try something new. But actually, what I've learned works the best is to ask questions. Why do we have these retrospectives? What do you expect to get out of them? I'm sometimes at companies where the, the retrospective fatigue sets in and they say, we're not getting anything out of it. And then I'm looking in my little black book. I've got a little black book where I write down everything about retrospectives. I write down the action points. I write down what happened with the action points. I write down what people said, what they discussed. And then I make a retrospective about the retrospectives. And I put down all the action points or the experiments that I wanted. And then I ask them to look at how many of them did you actually do? And what was the consequence of doing it? Oh yeah, we actually did change that. Yeah, we did, yeah we, did, we did change that, but we thought we just did that. Yeah, but that was part of the retrospective. And then there are some things that, that they didn't do yet. Like they didn't have time for it, or it was something that was put down as an experiment, but it was actually a long-term goal. And then a long-term goal written down as an experiment, you can't really expect that to happen in the two weeks. And then you have to look at that. So I do a retrospective over the retrospective, that's one way, to make them see that actually something came out of them. To, to make them understand that they are valuable to them. Instead of just forcing people to do retrospectives, I think asking questions is better and making them look at, at the data. And what happens now? The weeks pass. The boss will never allow it. We always discuss the testing framework. Why can't the retrospectives help us? We never get anything changed. Again, some sort of retrospective fatigue, but in a in a different way this time. They still like the retrospectives, but they're not solving the right problems. And it's the same problems coming up and up again. And that's the uh, anti-pattern that I call in the soup. And the problem with being in the soup is that you hear people saying, well, we work on all, we want to work on the big problems, not just the small problems about the coffee or how long the stand-up meetings should be. But also you hear people saying, we always discuss the same. It's like a groundhog day, so the symptom is the same as for the earlier pattern. And the anti-pattern solution is that the actions need management approval action, and then we can't do anything about it. We're just like, mm, meh, well, what, why bother with retrospectives? All our problems are out of our hands. And the consequences, of course, is that if management has different priorities, nothing happens and retrospectives degenerate into complaint sessions. And sometimes letting out air is good, and that's a good way of using a retrospective, but there should also be some actions that changes things. Otherwise, it will feel like a waste of time. So what do you do? Well, the refactor solution is stay out of the soup and come up with things that you can actually do something about. Yeah? Sorry? Oh, sorry. A, a cultural reference misrepresented. Sorry. Groundhog Day is, is an old American movie where a man wakes up each day to the same life because he's got some things he needs to learn. And he keeps on making the same mistakes and everything happens the same way, but gradually he's learning. Thank you for your question. Sorry. I should have thought about that. I thought everybody had seen Groundhog Day. Well, you, you should see it then. It's, it's a great movie. Um, so, so the refactored solution to this problem, and this is actually an activity I use <coughs> again and again and again. And you probably know this in different, in different states. Change, adapt, accept. So I draw three circles on a board. I say this is the circle of the things that you could do something about. This is the circle of the things that you can influence. And then out here we have the soup that you cannot do anything about apart from accepting its existence. And I, I use this activity both when they're just talking about the problems or the things that happened, just trying to make them think about where do these problems belong, but also actually later on in a retrospective, if they brainstormed about things to do, like experiments or activities, I force them to put it into the soup. Because sometimes if you come up with three activities that this team cannot do anything about, then when you ask them at the next retrospective what happened, they have to say nothing happened because they couldn't do anything. And then it's frustrating and it's a waste of time. So let's look at, at an example. So let's say that we, we made a timeline and then we took all the post-it notes or the important ones from the, from the timeline and put it into this diagram because I noticed that there are some things that always come up. Some things are directly in the do circle, things that we can do something about, like code review all made major changes. Uh, that is something that the team can do something about if they're allowed to take the time but they can just cheat or, or lie to the manager. Then there are some things that they can only influence, like the communication with testers is bad. 
that is not something necessarily that they can do something about, but they can definitely influence it. And here I am, I know that we have like cross-functional teams in Agile and the testers are with the developers and the developers are testers, but that's not always my reality. And then there's this one in the soup, change the location of the company. And of course, I mean, phew, how, can you, how can you change the location of the company? And if this was something that they wanted to spend an hour discussing, then it would be a waste of time. So it's better to sort of just be aware that this is something you can't do anything about. But then, for me, the interesting thing is if you start working with these things, if you're making course analysis, if you're actually discussing these post-it note things instead of just accepting them as they are, perhaps there's something you can do. Perhaps instead of just thinking about something you can only influence, perhaps there is an action you can do. Perhaps you can move closer to the testers and now it's something that the team can actually do something about instead of just trying to influence. And even up here, changing the location of the company is not something you could do, but perhaps you could influence it by saying we could have a local hop somewhere. If we were three people in this city, perhaps we could tell management that they would benefit from making a local hop here where we could work together instead of working <coughs> in three different houses. And that's what I meant with generating insights, that instead of just accepting what it says on the post-it notes, try having a discussion, try figuring out is there anything you can do to make these things move into the do circle. But also, importantly, to accept that there are some things in the soup that you cannot change. And then not, not think about it anymore. Find out how to adapt to it. And we'll skip that one again, because we need the last, and I only have six minutes left. So uh, Sarah hears other things. The retrospectives are boring. They are a waste of time. We should have a better facilitator. That's not something people say to her face, but she hears it like <laughs> somebody said it. But the interesting thing is it's not just them. It's also Sarah. Sarah is saying, I would like to get something out of these retrospectives as well, because she's a facilitator, but she's also part of the team. So le this leads us to something that I call do-it-yourself retrospectives. And... Uh, yeah, do-it-yourself can be difficult, right? But so the problem with the do-it-yourself retrospectives is that some say that the Scrum Master is responsible for the retrospectives. So some people think that if you're the Scrum Master, you're always the one to facilitate the retrospectives. Not necessarily a bad thing, but as I said, you can end in this anti-pattern. And the anti-pattern solution is let the Scrum Master facilitate every retrospective, but the consequences is that the Scrum Master now station in this week and this week and this week and then we had a bunch of facilitators, and then the facilitators would say, well, I can facilitate this week, or I can facilitate this week. And of course, some of the teams wanted the same facilitator all the time because they preferred that facilitator, but some teams wanted a new facilitator every time because they were easily bored and they needed new activities. Or perhaps there was somebody they didn't like, but they didn't want to say it, and then it's easier just to say, we want something, somebody new every time. So we made this rotation, and... Uh, I've tried it now only in two companies, but to me it works fine. Other companies choose to have an external facilitator coming in. And even sometimes the developers will be facilitators. Some of them like to do that as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be project leaders or team leaders who does it. So these were the, uh, the six anti-patterns for retrospectives that I chose to have. And as a resume of the talk, um, I hope that being aware of these anti-patterns will give you better retrospectives, more fun, or as I said, at least less painful. And uh, so I'd like to thank you for your time with this little cartoon. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Luckily, we have like one more minute. And you talked about distributed retrospectives. Is there anything in particular you wanted to know about? Or is it just generic? Yeah. Well, so I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just talk and talk for three and a half minutes about distributed retrospectives. So the problem with distributed retrospectives is that you cannot see the body language of people. Uh, people don't know each other as much as they do if they're together. And it's very difficult to see um, if people are being quiet while they're be why they're being quiet. So some of the things that I demand to have is that I want to see everybody on video. That can be difficult, of course, if the Wi-Fi is bad. But what normally happens if you put people down at a computer for an hour and they are not on video, if they mute themselves, you might not hear it, but if they don't mute themselves, you can hear the nice 
chatting sound on the keyboard or the email sound on the keyboard or even the click, click, click Google search or Facebook sound. On. I've become very good at hearing whether people are Facebooking or chatting or writing emails while they have the retrospectives. But if you have like their face, if you can see the face of everybody, then it's easier to spot if people are not there anymore. It's not because they're evil, it's because they don't think that this is important for me right now. So when, when people are zoning out, I'm not saying you should not be zoning out, you should not be doing email. I'm saying, is this discussion interesting for everybody? Or is this something that we should park right now and we should talk about that outside the retrospective? Another thing that's difficult with the distributed retrospectives is I can't see like the, the energy between people. If people are together, I can see those three huddling together over here, so they're probably in agreement about something, and somebody walking over there, so they're not in agreement, and then I can try to... That is an interesting thing, we need to discuss this, because I can see you disagree. I can't see that when it's online. Uh, so there's a different things that are difficult, but the, vi the video works, and then I normally have a shared document where they're anonymous, like a Google Doc, where everybody can write, and nobody knows who's writing. It can be fun. But it also helps with the sugar coating that we, was mentioned in the beginning, because I've done some retrospectives with some people in cultures that are less uh, polite than the Danish, and the problem is definitely the sugar coating. And what I've noticed is if you can be really anonymous when they put up things in the timeline, then people are more eager to try putting things that are painful up there. And I, I still don't want them to blame other people, but to point out things that are not good. So, yeah. Any anything else? Yes. I have a question with regards oh. to uh, real time uh, retrospective. Yes. So uh, we initiated this activity. Uh, maybe reinitiated it a couple of times as well. Mm -hmm. So it starts up with a bang. People come up with a lot of input, especially if the times are tough. You know, a couple of iterations. We have had some decisions, arguments. Uh, it starts off well enough. Sustaining that becomes a real task because the boards keep drying up and the posters themselves don't come up. We also tried an anonymous, you know, the Google Sheet approach. Mm -hmm. uh, even there, uh, so it, at times it seems like uh, a verbal uh, communication, people in front would be much beneficial. But when that you know, starts drying up, we go back to So there's a lot of to and fro. Mm -hmm. so is there any way to have a more sustained real time or, or sustained, how to sustain both of these approaches? Well, I think, I, think the, I think the answer to the question is generic, and I know I have to, so this will be the last, sorry. Um, I, I think the answer is generic, that again, you, people think it's, it's wonderful to start something new, there's a lot of positive energy, but to sustain it, they need to know that they get something out of it. So I'll say again, perhaps you did that already, but the point is to show them exactly, this is what we get out of this, because then they feel like they want to do it, and remind them perhaps every day, at 2 o'clock, there's a little ping on their computer saying, was there anything you needed to put on the real-time board today? I don't know if that's helpful. But I think it's always that if people stop doing things, it's because they don't see the point. Some some other things have got higher priority, and they forget. Yeah, I think that was it. Thank you.